All right, we've got a good number of folks here today. I haven't checked the, uh, the Facebook feed to see how many people we have uh, logged in there as well, but I'm hoping uh, the, everybody who can't or wasn't able to make it here today has uh, joined us online. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, started off kind of cold this morning, but it looks like it's going to be a pretty day, so that's always uh, a blessing to have some good bright sunshine uh, out and around us. Um, uh, at the beginning of the new year, I always like to uh, go ahead and get started with a, a series. Um, I will typically plan out one of two ways. Um, the plan that I had last year kind of went out the window real fast. Uh, but what I intend to do for us this year is I want to go to the book of Nehemiah. Um, and every month, the first Sunday of every month, I'm going to preach a lesson out of the book of Nehemiah. And I think it's important for us to remember what happened in the book of Nehemiah and how what happened in Nehemiah uh, can apply to us today. Because if you, if you take a very quick overview of the book of Nehemiah, you'll, you'll see a couple of things, and we're going to talk about some of them today. You'll see that the city of Jerusalem had been uh, laid waste. The, the gates were down, the walls were torn down, and there was a, a lot of destruction in the city of Jerusalem, right? And so this is part one uh, of, of a conversation on the destruction in the city of Jerusalem. But you'll see that Nehemiah became aware of this. Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem and, and he started putting things back together. Uh, and so there was, there was a lot of work that needed to be done. There were a lot of setbacks that happened. There were a lot of changes that needed to be made. There were a lot of, a lot of issues that Nehemiah had to deal with along the way. And it all started because of this destruction that had been wreaked in, uh, in Jerusalem uh, by the Babylonians and had, and had been left laid waste for years. And though it's not been years, we've had a lot of things go on this past year. Uh, 2020, uh, for a lot of people I know, has been the worst year they've ever experienced in their life. Um, and some of these folks have lived a lot of years. Um, I know that there have been a lot of setbacks. I know there's been a lot of damage done. I know there have been a lot of people harmed. I know that there have been several people that have been lost. I know that our day-to-day -day actions, uh, what we normally do, how we normally meet, how we normally worship, all of those things have been disrupted. All of those things have been turned upside down. And, and there are a lot of people in this world, there are a lot of people in this country, there are a lot of people in the state or in the city or even within this congregation who have been, uh, been put into distress, major distress, because of a lot of the things that have happened over the past 12 months. Now, I don't want to limit that just to the disruptions because of the coronavirus, right? There have been a lot of other things that have happened. There have been personal things. There have been some health things. A lot of things have come about over this past year, and, and it seems like we just are getting kicked while we're down. But if you go to the book of Nehemiah and you read what happened before Nehemiah got word of the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. And you can see a people who had been kicked a few good times while they were down. Now, there are a lot of different reasons why things happen, why bad things happen, why problems come up, and, and we're going to address a few of those. We know very specifically why Jerusalem had been destroyed, and Nehemiah talks about that some today. And I'm not here to say by any stretch of the imagination that bad things happen to each one of us individually because of our own personal and individual sin. That's not the lesson I'm preaching today. That is a lesson I can preach from Nehemiah, but that's not the one I'm preaching today. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that we all run into these problems. We all run into these difficulties. We all run into these challenges. And if you say you've not run into these challenges before, you've either not lived long enough or you're lying to me. Because quite frankly, we all get knocked around. And we all get kicked while we're down. And there are times when we are called to come uh, and to lift uh, ourselves back up or to lift others back up and to start the process of restoring and rebuilding whatever it is that suffered that damage. And so whether it's your own heart that's been hurt, whether it's your spirit, your spiritual life that's been hurt, whether it's your worship that's been harmed, 
whether it's uh, just the simple fact that everything in your life has been disrupted. You maybe have lost a job. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you've been sick. Maybe a loved one's been sick. There are a lot of things that can happen in our lives that cause us to be harmed. And this is a great opportunity at the beginning of this brand new year for us to talk about how we move forward from those kinds of things, from those difficulties and those challenges. How do we put that one foot in front of another? How do we draw that next breath? How do we face that next day? And no matter what we seem to face, there will be another day. As long as the Lord delays in His coming, We'll have another opportunity. Today is that opportunity. Now, again, granted, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, but if it comes, there's that another opportunity to take that next step, to draw that next breath, and to help be restored and to rebuild. And so let's go ahead and go to the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles with you and you want to follow along, uh, go to Nehemiah chapter 1. I will have it up here on the, uh, on the monitors. So the first thing that we see when we go to the book of Nehemiah and we start in chapter 1 and we start in verse 1 is we see that Nehemiah becomes aware, he is made aware of the problem with his home city of Jerusalem. Now remember, Nehemiah is not in Jerusalem, right? He's in Susa. He's, he's serving the king. He's the cupbearer of the king. We'll see that again here at the end of the chapter. This is a man who is trusted. He is a man who is in high position. He is a man who has some, some influence and some authority there in, uh, while he's away in captivity. And so we see this word come to him in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We read the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Shislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from, Jeru from Judah, and, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. So his brethren come along and he asks them, hey guys, what's going on? He, he's got some, some of his fellow Jews have come and he's interested. Um, how, how are the people in the exile doing? Are they doing okay? Are they prospering? Some of them are, some of them aren't. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, who escaped? Do you know who all made it out of Jerusalem before the destruction? Okay, some made it out, some didn't. Okay, well what about the city? Well, the city here is a stand-in. Let me, let, me, let me make something very clear here. The city of, a, of Jerusalem is a stand-in for the people of God. When we think about the city, don't just think about the buildings. Don't think about the streets. Don't just think about the gates or think about the walls. Think about the people of God. Think about those who should have been following God. Think about those who were dependent upon God and dependent upon His covenant. So we're not just talking about the city. Maybe He asked about the exiles. Maybe He asked about those who are in captivity. Maybe He asked about all of them. But we see the focus. We see the concentration on the city. And the city is the people. It's not just a spot on the map. And that's why when he hears about the condition of the city, it breaks his heart so badly. And so we read in verse 3, it says, And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. See? They're connected. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Jerusalem had endured a siege and was destroyed. And it's, it's a long-term proposition to lay siege to a city. And in order to make sure that city does not rebel against you again, the people, right? What do you do? You make them defenseless. You tear down the walls. You burn the gates. You disband the army. You kill the soldiers. You exile the nobles, the nobility, the upper class. You confiscate their wealth. You burn their crops. You poison their wells. You do all of these things to make sure that you have absolutely crippled a population so they don't 
ever fight back. But that leaves them vulnerable to everything around them. And if you go and you read about what was going on in the area during the time of Nehemiah before the walls were rebuilt, and we're going to read about this as we go through the, uh, through the rest of the book, you're going to read that they had some enemies nearby. They, they had uh, some Arabians who had moved into the area that were taking advantage of them. They had some Samaritans uh, who were to the north of them who were taking advantage of them. You had some other people inside the city who were profiting off of the misery of their own people. And so what happens to us when we get knocked down? When our defenses are down, we become susceptible to every other problem that comes along. Doesn't it always seem like those problems come in waves? One thing after another, after another, after another. And when our defenses are down, that becomes a far heavier burden than it otherwise would have. So what do we have to do? What do we have to do? Well, let's look at what Nehemiah did after he found out about the destruction that, that was causing so many problems for the people of Jerusalem. The second thing that we see here is that, that Nehemiah orients himself toward the problem. And what do I mean by orienting yourself? Well, if you ever get turned around, what do you need to do? Find a direction. It may be I can, I can find Cardinal North and I can work from there. Maybe I can find a landmark and I can work from there. Maybe I can find a, a, a street that I'm familiar with. Maybe I can find somebody to help give me directions. But something, that, uh, something needs to be done in order for me to be pointed in the right direction. I have to orient myself. I have to know where I'm at. I have to know what's going on around me. And Nehemiah orients himself toward the problem. In fact, the very first thing that we see him do is that he approaches God as soon as he understands the damage that has been done. I remember, and I've mentioned this a couple of times because it made an impression on me, I remember at one point in time seeing a bumper sticker. It says, when all else fails, try prayer. And I thought to myself, man, you've got that backwards. <laughs> uh, and, then it, and oddly enough, ironically enough, it wasn't too long after that, I saw another bumper sticker. And this actually happened to you, this isn't a preacher story. Uh, I saw another bumper sticker that said, before all else fails, try prayer. And I thought, that's the way to go. And so Nehemiah approaches God as soon as he understands what's going on. And in fact, in verse 4, Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah records, As soon as I heard these words, as soon, the second I knew something was wrong, the second I knew something was wrong, he did something. I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speculate here, and I think it's, this is a pretty fair assumption. I'm going to say Nehemiah was a man of prayer to start with. I'm going to say Nehemiah was a man of prayer to start with. He probably spent some time every day praying to God. Because as soon as he understands the problem, as soon as he knows what happened, he went back to God in prayer. And, and the Jews typically were a very demonstrative people. They liked to show their emotions outwardly. They'd rip their garments. They'd sit and uh, you know, put on the sackcloth, sit in the ashes. They'd weep and wail and moan. And, and all of that was to express their emotions. We're rather stoic people. We don't like to show our emotions. But the Jews showed them outwardly, especially when it came to spiritual things. And so he's wept and he mourned and he fasted. But most importantly, he prayed. And if we are the people of God that we're supposed to be, prayer is going to be the very first thing we're going to do to orient ourselves when we have a problem. The second thing that we see that Nehemiah does to orient himself is that he, accepts, he accepted responsibility to address the problem. Now, I want to make something very clear here. As I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson, sometimes our problems are brought about by our own personal sin. 
Sometimes they are. Sometimes we, we, have, we are reaping what we have sown. And that's one set of problems, and we have to address that with repentance too, as we're going to see Nehemiah do. But sometimes the problem is not our fault. It's the fault of sin in general, yes. And it may be the direct result of somebody else's sin. They've done something to us. It may be the fault that there is sin in the world and bad things happen because of sin. We have the destructive power of nature. We have the, uh, the, the falling apart of our bodies. We have the, the illnesses that come along. We have accidents that may happen. Sometimes the problems aren't anybody's direct fault, but just the result of sin. Either way, no matter which one of these things happens to have been the cause of your problem or of my problem, I am in the middle of it, so I am the one who can take responsibility and address the problem. There may be few physical actions I can take, but there's always something that can be done. And God expects us to be people of action. We're told all throughout the New Testament to prepare ourselves. Be ready to answer. Be ready to act. And so we see Nehemiah, he accepts that responsibility to address the problem. We have to take action, much like Nehemiah takes. Now, we see in this first step of addressing the problem that Nehemiah confesses the sin of Israel. Look at verse 5 through 6. He says, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandment, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. And so we see, if we back up here for just another second or two, we see here that Nehemiah, even as he is accepting national corporate responsibility for the sins of Israel, he is accepting his personal responsibility to take some action in addressing the problem. I wonder how many other people in Israel at this time were offering up this prayer. There may have been a few, but it didn't seem to me, as I go through and I read the rest of Nehemiah, that there were a lot of people who were ready to take on that responsibility. It doesn't seem to me that most of the people of Jerusalem believed that they could act or even believed that they should act. They were ready to sit there and to, and to allow the, the problems that were surrounding them continue. How many of us, and I'm, I'm going to tell you I'm as guilty of this as anybody else, how many of us before have had things go wrong and we sit in that self-pity and we do nothing? Man, I'm just a victim here. Man, this, this thing just happened to me. Man, oh man, I can't do nothing. But there's always something we can do. Even if it's just orienting ourselves toward the problem and lifting up our voices to God in prayer. Because James tells us what? The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Availeth, if you want to go back to old King James, right? Continuous action availeth is. It's doing some good. Before all else fails, before anything else is done, come to God in prayer. And Nehemiah has taken that responsibility. The first thing we see him do is offer this prayer to God. Moving further on, we see here that he also recognizes the root cause of the problem. Now, one of the things that I've mentioned twice already and I'm going to say, but right now, the problems that we face aren't always our fault. Sometimes they are. And we have to recognize the root of the problem. Something goes wrong, 
Did I do something wrong? Self-examination, self-reflection, a little bit of appropriate self-criticism, uh, appreciating feedback from other people, making sure that we know where our actions and our responsibility lie in things, and sometimes we are responsible for what happened. And denying that responsibility can lead to devastating spiritual and sometimes physical consequences. And so we have to know, we have to understand where the true root of the problem is. And as I've said very specifically in Nehemiah, we know where the problem in Jerusalem originated from. It came from Jerusalem and Judah's just stiff-necked resistance against following after God. They were a rebellious people. We even see all the way up through the time of Jeremiah and Jehoiakim and all those that were in that period of time. Jeremiah was preaching one thing and, and the king of Judah was doing the other. And he ended up dying at the hands of a rogue arrow. And then Nebuchadnezzar came and laid waste to the city because of their sins. Verse 7 through 9, we read, We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you amongst the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though, you're, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen and make my name dwell there. Nehemiah understood the root cause of the problem. Nehemiah understood that even though he personally may not have been responsible for the destruction of the city of Jerusalem, he knew his people were. And Nehemiah also knows that he is a man who is in a position of power, in a position of authority, and that he has the opportunity to do something. And so he must. He accepts that responsibility. And he understands what needs to be done. And so as we read through the book of Nehemiah, we're going to see that Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem and he starts rebuilding the walls and he starts and he hangs the gates and he starts to do all of these great things for the city. But he also starts correcting the hearts and the minds of the people that were there. Because the walls being rebuilt weren't going to do the city of Jerusalem any good if the hearts of the people weren't rebuilt and restored. You know, sometimes when we've had these bad things happen to us, sometimes when we, when we feel like Job sitting in sackcloth in, in the ashes and, and wondering, man, how much worse could it possibly get? And then something else happens, right? His friends came, they, they did really good for the first few days. And then Job freaks out in chapter 3, and the people turn on him. Man, how much worse could it get? But when we understand the problem, and Job didn't understand the problem, right? And we see him talking, and very clearly he doesn't understand the problem. But we see when things are so bad that there's always an opportunity to rebuild and restore. And the final thing that we see Nehemiah do after he is made aware of the problem and orients himself toward the problem with all those things we mentioned, but we see Nehemiah determines to take action to correct the problem before him. When things are out of our control, when they seem at their worst, when we don't know what to do at all, sometimes those things paralyze us. I'm not going to fuss too much at the people in the city of Jerusalem at that moment. Yes, what happened to them was their fault. Yes, they were still rebellious against God. 
But how many of us would have been in a great emotional or spiritual condition after our city had been sieged and burned and laid waste to? I mean, we have a hard time staying in our houses for a couple of weeks. What happens when our whole world burns down around us? Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like that? What do you do? What do you do when you're there? Well, you to gather up whatever responsibility you can take. You lay on your shoulders the heaviest burden that you can possibly bear. And you take one breath and you take one step. And then you take another breath and another step. And you take that responsibility and you fulfill it as well as you can. It may simply be the only thing you can do is be fervent in prayer. Or it may be where you can take the Word of God and take action and change things for the better for yourself and for those who depend on you and those who surround you. Nehemiah takes on a tremendous burden. Nehemiah takes on a responsibility that would stagger most people. And he determines to take action to correct the problem before him. Look at what he says throughout the end of the chapter. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Lord, I know these people belong to you. I know that you love them. Because you have redeemed them, you have established this covenant with them. And, and they need to come back to you. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now a little foreshadowing here. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah is about to go to the king and he's about to make a request. And that request, if fulfilled, is going to allow him to shoulder the responsibility of the restoration and the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and the reestablishment of the people as the people of God. So it's an amazing thing that he does. But what can we learn from this lesson? There are a few quick things that I think we can do. Oh, let me... There we go. When we've been hurt, we must take it upon ourselves to make things better by doing a couple of things. One, understand the problem. What's happened? What happened? Sometimes we're standing around scratching our head going, what happened? Don't just ask the question, find the answer. Sometimes that means we have to look in the mirror and we have to say, okay, here are some decisions that I made that, that really didn't work out so well. What can I do better? What can I do different? Sometimes we can look and we can say, hey, this, this happened because uh, so and so and this happened and that happened. And we can look at the external circumstances and we can say, okay, how, how do I prevent that from harming me anymore? Or we can say, you know, this is a consequence of sin in the world. And this is something that I'm going to have to pray my way through and something that we just have to deal with. We have to understand the problem. Number two, we make things better by orienting ourselves toward God. It's real easy, real easy to shake your fist and scream at the sky when things go wrong. God, why have you done this to me? God, why have you let this happen to me? God, why are bad things happening? God, I'm a good person. Why are bad things happening? Well, that's a consequence of sin. And it's easy to say that when we're talking in a sermon and we're talking theory, right? We have to know this. We have to understand this. And even before we enter into these bad things. But I'm here to tell you, once you turn away from God, things do not get better. You have to turn toward God. Face Him. Exercise your faith. 
and you'll see things clearly. It may even take number two before you get a good hold on number one. But we have to orient ourselves toward God. We also have to determine to take action to resolve the problem. What is that action going to be? Am I just going to give up? Am I just going to roll over? No. No. The Hebrew writer says we are not of those who shrink back. God has no pleasure in those who shrink back. But we are going to move forward toward God toward understanding His love and seeing these problems through. And finally, we're going to rely on God's strength to see us through. When I'm talking about orienting ourselves, taking action, resolving to end the problem, when I'm talking about all of those things, uh, there are people in this world who will tell you, you've got the strength within you to do all of that. And the people throw buckets of money at folks for saying things like that. Just turn on the TV about 4 o'clock in the morning when there's nothing else on. You'll see them. Put your hand on the TV screen. Send me $1,000. And man, you, you got it all figured out. We're not going to be able to do it on our own. But the good thing is, God will see us through it. Just like Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just like Jesus talked about the fact that we don't have to be afraid in this world because we belong to the Father and the Father has overcome the world. All of these things are there to comfort us and to encourage us so that we can overcome. This is the first step. Every Sunday... Every first Sunday of the month, for the rest of this year, we're going to have a lesson out of the book of Nehemiah. And if you haven't yet, go ahead and reread. If you haven't read it recently, go ahead and reread Nehemiah. Understand what Nehemiah has to go through, and you're going to see the progress that he makes. And over the course of this year, we're going to see the progress we've made. Every step along the way. What happens at the end of the book of Nehemiah? Well, here's a spoiler alert. The city is restored. Where are you and I going to be at the end of 2021? Hopefully we will stand as strong as the walls of Jerusalem were standing after Nehemiah had completed his work. It starts today. If you're here today and you are not yet a child of God, if you need to be baptized in order to have your sins washed away, know that we stand ready to assist you in any way we need, you need. If you're here today and you are a child of God, but you find that the circumstances of, of, of this past year or any other time have worn you down and you need to be restored back to your place in the kingdom of God. If you have sin that separated you from your heavenly Father and you need to repent of that sin, whatever your spiritual need is, today is your opportunity to orient yourself back toward God and to start that process of rebuilding and restoration even if it's just one brick at a time. If you're here today and you have any spiritual need, won't you come now, let that need be made known as we stand and sing our invitation song.